Hello and welcome to our service on this third Sunday of Epiphany. A very warm welcome to you, whether this is your first time to join us or whether this is uh, your regular worship slot, in which case uh, you'll be very familiar with the, the order of service. This Sunday we are going to be thinking about Jesus turning water into wine and Martin Belux is going to be asking us to consider the extravagance and hugeness of the generosity of God's love and grace. And we're going to therefore begin by singing a song which emphasises that our God is a great big God and that's why he can never run out of love and blessings to pour upon us. He after all is the creator of the whole universe so therefore he's never going to run out of anything. So let's now join the Murrell family and the Smiths as we sing Our God is a Great Big God. Summon the day to dawn. You teach the morning to waken the earth. Great is your name. Great is your love. For you the valley valleys shall sing for joy. The trees of the field shall clap their hands. Great is your name. Great is your love. For you the monarchs of the earth shall bow, the poor and persecuted shall shout for joy. Great is your name, great is your love. Your love and mercy shall last for ever, fresh as the morning, sure as the sunrise. Great your name, great 
is your love. Lord God, early in the morning, when the world was young, you made life in all its beauty and terror. You gave birth to all that we, that we know. Hallowed be your name. Hallowed be your name. Early in the morning, when the world least expected it, a newborn child crying in a cradle announced that you had come, that you were one of us. Hallowed be your name. Hallowed be your name. Early in the morning, surrounded by respectable liars, religious leaders, leaders, anxious statesmen, and silent friends, you accepted the penalty for doing good, for being God. You shouldered and suffered the cross. Hallowed be your name. Hallowed be your name. Early in the morning, a voice in a guarded graveyard and footsteps in the dew proved that you had risen, that you came back to those and for those who had forgotten, denied and destroyed you. Hallowed be your name. Hallowed be your name. Early in the morning, in the multicoloured way of your church on earth and in heaven, we celebrate your creation, your life, your death and resurrection, your interest in us. So to, to you we pray, Lord, bring new life where we are warm and tired. New love, where we have turned hard-hearted. Forgiveness, where we feel hurt and where we have wounded. And the joy and freedom of your Holy Spirit, where we are the prisoners of ourselves. To all and to each where regret is real, God pronounces pardon and grants us the right to begin again. Thanks be to God. Amen. You don't have to read the New Testament for very long before you start to realise that the world in which Jesus moved was a very different world from the world in which we move today, some 2,000 years later. Particularly when we come to a text like the wedding at Cana in Galilee, where Jesus turned the water into wine. And so I'm very pleased today to welcome Sue Green uh, to lead us in a reflection about how important it is as Christians that we realise that the love of God is a love which can be acceptable to and understood by people of all cultures because God speaks the universal language of love but therefore if we are to understand our fellow Christians we've got to get our minds around the fact that love can be expressed in many different cultures in many different ways so welcome now to Sue who's going to lead us in her reflection Around 12 years ago, I was lucky enough to make a sabbatical in Sri Lanka and was able to work alongside the Anglican Church there and to learn from them. When you hear about people talk about Sri Lanka or Ceylon, if you're a little older than me, you probably imagine a jewel of an island set in a blue sea. 
The sun shines, the palms wave in the wind, and a smell of spices drifts gently on the wind. While it is a lovely island, the reality is not quite like that. There are strong divisions. The official religion is Buddhism, but there are many Hindus and a strong representation from Christians and Muslims. There are three main languages, Sinhala, Tamil and English. And not only are these languages unrelated, but each one uses a completely different alphabet. While I was there, the long-running war between the Sinhalese government and the Hindu Tamil Tigers was drawing towards its hideous conclusion, with atrocities and cruelties inflicted by both sides. So how is the Christian Church to respond to all that and to show the light of Christ's love in such darkness? They did it by showing no partiality and by caring for all. By doing everything they could to lower the temperature, to promote understanding and to bring people together. When I realised that the reading for today was to be about the wedding at Cana, my thoughts went at once to the Cathedral of the Living Saviour in Colombo and to the murals that have been created there. One of them is a picture of the wedding at Cana and it shows this lovely depiction of a Sri Lankan wedding of family and friends gathered together to celebrate a happy occasion. Now what is obvious to any Sri Lankan, but needs to be explained if you're a foreigner like me, is that this wedding is between a Sinhala man and a Tamil woman. Marriages like this are still rare in the island, so it's in some ways quite a shocking scene. But you can see the two families, one on the right and the other on the left, eyeing each other up cautiously and wondering if their children are really doing the right thing here. It brings home to us something we often ignore about this first of Jesus' miracles, that it happened at a wedding. It happened when two families who had been separate come together. It happens when something new is begun, when there is a change in relationship, when there is a chance of something new arising as two people come together and start a new dynasty. In the background there you can see a well. That same well occurs in another mural where Jesus meets the woman of Samaria. So we know that this is the well from which the water of life is drawn. Jesus takes the water of life. He turns it into wine which restores us and brings us joy. And his first miracle is to reconcile and to bring together those who feel they are not part of the same family, and he makes them into one. Thank you very much, Sue, for taking us into the world of Sri Lanka and getting some idea of what it's like to live in a world where there are so many cultures and religions and traditions all jostling together and how Jesus' words speak into that multicultural situation. Well, our hymn is a bit of a multicultural hymn in the sense that it was written particularly to draw out the Old Testament themes which are nevertheless relevant to Jesus' New Testament uh, teaching. And as Christians, as we read the New Testament, we, like Jesus, need to be going back to the Old Testament to see just where his teaching is coming from. So we'll be singing the God of Abraham praise and after that hymn then Charles Mowat will read to us the story of the wedding at Cana in Galilee and then uh, Martin will lead us in our thoughts. So let's sing the God of Abraham praise.
the third day, there was a wedding in Cana of Galilee, and the mother of Jesus was there. Jesus and his disciples had also been invited to the wedding. When the wine came out, the mother of Jesus said to him, They have no wine. And Jesus said to her, Woman, what concern is that to you and to me? My hour has not yet come. His mother said to the servants, do whatever he tells you. Now, standing there, there were six stone water jars of, for the Jewish rites of purification, each holding 20 or 30 gallons. Jesus said to them, fill the jars with water. And they filled them up to the brim. He said to them, now draw some out and take it to the chief steward. And so they took it. When the steward tasted the water that had become wine and did not know where it came from, even though the servants who had drawn the water knew it, the steward called the bridegroom and said to him, everyone serves the good wine first and then the inferior wine after the guests have become drunk. But you have kept the good wine until now. Jesus did this, the first of his signs, in Cana of Galilee, and revealed his glory. And his disciples believed in him. Holy Spirit, speak through me today and inspire us afresh as we approach this familiar and awesome story of water into wine. Back in November 2018, when we were able to travel, Angela and I visited Latvia for the 100th anniversary of their independence. And my travel book of choice was something called Beautiful Outlaw by a man called John Eldridge. And if I uh, just give you the precy of the front cover, beautiful outlaw experiencing the playful, disruptive, extravagant personality of Jesus. Apologies, Hazel, if this book should be back in St Andrew's Library, but maybe someone listening would like to borrow it from me. John Eldridge makes the point that six water jars holding approximately 25 gallons each is in metric terms 682 litres or 908 bottles of wine. That is surely showing the extravagant personality of Jesus. I must admit that I used to struggle with this passage because of Jesus' response to his mother but reading it again this week, I see the understanding between them. Mary knew that Jesus would be able to provide, yet he did not feel that this was the setting to start in. But in the dialogue together, an understanding is reached. And I'll quote uh, some of John's book here. John's Gospel states, Jesus thus revealed his glory. What is it exactly that Jesus thus revealed? Certainly his power over creation. But there is something else here, something beautiful. Jesus did not provide cheap wine as the maitre d' expected, given the lateness of the hour. Nor did he make a statement by substituting grape juice he didn't just give them a little wine, say a dozen bottles to wrap up the evening with one last toast. Jesus does it lavishly, to the tune of 908 bottles. Oh, the beauty of Jesus. The text declares that he hadn't planned on revealing himself at this time. But ask and it will be given to you. Seek and you will find. Knock and the door will be opened to you. 
Now, John Eldridge lives in Colorado, where our cousins live, and they have over 300 days a year of sunshine. So he mentions the blessing of sunshine each day, warming the land. Also, surprisingly, as Colorado is so far inland, he mentions the waves on the seashore. And I would like to read you a little bit of what he says about that. If you can put yourselves onto the beach and experience those waves coming in. Just join with John in this text. I am sitting on the beach this evening, watching the swells roll in toward me. Every wave builds as it approaches, ascending, taking shape, deep greens below sweeping upward into translucent aqua aquamarine, a sculpture in motion, curling forth like shavings from a jade carving. The sheer elegance is enough to take my breath away. The wave I'm fixed upon crashes to the sand like a work of art toppling from its pedestal. But before I can feel the loss, Another is rushing in to take its place, sweeping upward, forward, utterly mesmerizing beauty. Then comes another, then another, and another, in an unending procession. All things were made through him, comes to mind, and without him nothing has been made that has been made. What are the waves telling us about Jesus? And I look down, Scattered at my feet lie a thousand shells, delicate, intricate, the work of a jeweller, an artist with very small tools and exceptional eyesight. If this is all the work of an artist's hand, what does it tell us about the art artist? Creation is epic and intimate. He is epic and intimate. Everywhere around me an obsession with beauty and attention to detail. But most of all, I am thunderstruck by the abundant generosity strewn around and constantly rolling in. How do you describe this, this extravagance? What kind of person acts like this? So this got me to thinking about what we can see of the extravagance of Jesus, the word of God here around us at this time in January. Driving to work in the morning now, I'm just about able to see the drifts of snowdrops coming out because there's just enough light as I drive across Langford Common and down onto the A38 to see those drifts of snowdrops. And another great image for me, which I used back in the autumn in Brompton Rolf at a service, is of a conker. I took a bowl of conkers to Brompton Rolf because we had so many thousand of them fallen off of the tree in our garden. Each person took a conker to pray with. And we discovered that each conker is different and each is beautiful and filled with promise, just like us. So we give thanks this morning for our beautiful, extravagant God, revealed to us through the Holy Spirit in the person of Jesus, and revealed to the world today through us, his body on earth. I wanted to finish this talk with the image of a font that we discovered in France a few years ago, but I couldn't find my picture of it. However, I'll have you picture it in your minds. We walked into this typical French church and as we opened the door at the back, immediately inside, was a font, but this was just not any old font. It was very, very special because the water in it was welling up and overflowing the top continually. And it reminded me so much of the story we've had today of those wine jars, those water jars overflowing with new wine, fresh wine, the best wine. I'm sure that's what the sculptor who made this font in France had in mind. So may we, each of us, well up with the gifts that God has given us 
and be a blessing to those around us today, this week, this year, and forevermore. Amen. Let us pray. We pray to the source of all being, the abundant giver of life, the universe and everything. We give thanks for your generous pouring out in creation, stars and planets, rocks and seas, life and intelligence. We give thanks for the fruits of the earth and the work of human hands, for the needs met and pleasures shared in weddings and parties of every kind. We give thanks for the precious gifts of good government and pray for the President and Congress of the United States of America. At home, we give thanks for those giving so abundantly of their time, talent, energy and money in response to world pandemic. We give thanks for the medical staff and care workers working till they drop, for researchers delivering vaccinations and treatments in record time. We thank you for the continued abundance on our supermarket shelves, witness to the tireless, to the tireless labours of farmers, distribution and shop workers, and the key workers for our mains and drains who keep us fed and watered and warm. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Eternal Word At Cana you showed us abundant love in action, we pray for churches struggling to find the way and do the work in a world upside down. 
We pray for Bishop Ruth, Martin, our rector, and all church wardens and church councillors charged with finding new channels for your abundant grace. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. And for ourselves, we pray that we may be infected by the joyful giving you modelled at Cana, so we in turn may give more abundantly. Lord, in your mercy. Thank you very much, Adam, for leading us in prayer. Just one notice from me today, which is about prayer. Uh, firstly, I hope that you uh, benefited from following the Archdeaconry Days course on prayer. Uh, many people have commented to me on how useful and helpful it was and how refreshing. Well, the diocese have just informed me that uh, there's going to be a similar Lent course coming up in three weeks' time when Lent begins. So this is a good time to think whether you could join up with some friends or a house group or however you can get together uh, virtually or down the telephone line or however, or even on a walk in the countryside um, so that you can experience more of these uh, times where we can grow in prayer. No better way to spend Lent. And uh, the other thing I would love to say is it will be great to hear from you about uh, how you're finding uh, worship uh, online during the lockdown um, and if there's any particular needs that you would like uh, us to have a go at meeting then within the bounds of technical possibilities I'm sure we'd like to be set a challenge so do please get in touch let me know how you're finding it um, and what you'd like to see in future services and We'll certainly uh, give it some serious thought and see what can be done. Now we'll sing our final hymn, which uh, is going to be led by the Benson family. It's all about inviting the Holy Spirit into our lives to make him welcome here so that he can lavish upon us all the generous and abundant gifts of God's Spirit, his love, his peace, kindness, faithfulness, gentleness, all the things that uh, we love to receive from God. Uh, and therefore, let's now sing with the Bensons. <laughs> Your glory, God, is what our hearts long for, to be 
the extravagant love of God be the passion in your heart. The joy of God, your strength when times are hard. The presence of God, an abundant peace that overflows. The word of God, the seed that you might sow. So may the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son and the Holy Spirit be with you and remain with you and those for whom you pray this day this week, and for evermore. Amen.